My name is Sandy Knapp and I'm the current president of the Linnaean Society of London and welcome everyone to the Society. The Society is a very interesting, um, an interesting place because it, we welcome as fellows people from all walks of life who have a passion for natural history and want to help us achieve our mission and vision to bring natural history to everyone of every background and all ages and to, and to use that knowledge to help conserve the planet that we live on with all the rest of the species. So we have a broad um, kind of range of, of talks. And if you're not a fellow, please do consider becoming a fellow. There is a membership, a membership application on our website. So we have the great privilege this evening of having Professor Alan Goeli to speak to us tonight. And Alan is a professor of mathematical modeling at the University of Oxford, and he's a member of the Mathematical Institute. He's director of the Oxford Center for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and, um, and, and a fellow of St. Catherine's College. At the Mathematical Institute, he's also in charge of their public lecture series. So I think we're up for, uh, in for a real treat. After getting his PhD at the University of Brussels, Alain joined the Department of Mathematics at the University of Arizona. And in 2010, he moved to Oxford where he is now. His science is that of applied mathematics, but he has broad interests in maths, mechanics, sciences, and engineering, which leads him to collaborate closely with researchers from many, many disciplines. So a real Linnaean person collaborating acro across the piece. And tonight he'll talk to us about the movements and habits of plants, a unified theory of tropism and taxis. And I hope he'll convince you that plants do behave. Alan, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandy. And thank you for the Dinan Society for uh, the invitation. It's a great pleasure and it's a great honor to speak tonight. Even though, of course, I'm extremely disappointed not being able to visit your wonderful uh, place, your house. Wait where the society resides, uh, hopefully for another time. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some work that I've been doing, and it's uh, the product of a long reflection that I've had with mostly with Derek Moulton, uh, who is also a professor in the Math Institute, and I've been collaborating with him on a number of topics, such as seashell and chameleon tongues and other fun things for many years. And we've been wondering about how to uh, express mathematically some of the behavior and some of the shape and the dynamics that you see in plants. Uh, somebody else who's been instrumental is Adrien uh, Oliveri, who is a postdoc in my group. Uh, he's been help helping us putting the piece together. So the main goal is to try to understand and frame mathematically the behavior of plants regarding the stimulus. Um, it's not a new topic. Actually, you can go a very long way back uh, in ancient time uh, to, to find description of the behavior of uh, plants uh, with respect to uh, the sun, for instance. In uh, Ovid Metamorphosis, uh, very almost two, now 2,000 years ago, uh, you can read the story of uh, Clitia. Uh, who is a water nymph, and Clitia is uh, uh, desperately in love with uh, Apollo or Helios, the sun. And after uh, Helios uh, brushes off, she goes and uh, sits on a rock, and for nine days she sits and follows the sun, follow uh, Helios in in the sky. Uh, and after after nine days, she turns into uh, a, a plant, she turns into, uh, depending on the translation, she turns into a flower. And this is what you can read in Ovid. Although a root now holds a fast to us, the heliotrope turns ever to the sun, as if to prove that all may change and love through all remain. So depending on the translation, uh, the English translation tells us that she's transformed into the term soul or the heliotrope. The French translation is uh, she's transformed into the sunflower. This is why in, in Versailles you can admire these, uh, these uh, 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 murals where you see in the background the sunflower. Of course the sunflower is not quite appropriate because you might have seen this beautiful picture of sunsets uh, and what you see, the sunset with a field, beautiful uh, field of sunflower. And what makes them beautiful is that you see both the sun and the sunflower. But 
what you should realize is that the sunflower is not turning to the sun. It's turning to the east so that it can catch the sun in the morning. It does not actually follow, follow, follow the sun. But clearly, this type of observation have been done for a very long time, and there have been many theories about it. So the general topic of how plant respond to uh, stimulus, so it grows according to its environment, it's called plant tropism, and related mostly to what you could say overall to biological motion. And depending whether you talk about plants or animal, you'll have, you'll talk about taxis in the case of, of, uh, of animal or cells for motion that is in direction related to a stimulus. For instance, here you have an axon that is uh, directed mostly to chemical signaling, but also by a variety of other signal in order to find its right target during development of the uh, nervous system. You'll talk about kinesis for undirected motion in response to a stimulus. But as for plants, we talk about tropism, and tropism means the motion in a direction related to stimulus, exactly the same definition. For instance, gravitropism, if you, if you just suddenly uh, change the orientation of a flower and wait a long time, this is a slow, slow motion movie, uh, it, will, it will go back to the vertical. You will talk about nastic motion for undirected motion in response to a stimulus. Initially, I wanted to present you a very big theory uh, that would relate both what we've been, what, what happened in accents, for instance, with what happens in plants, and the title, but I, I realized that it was a little bit over ambitious. Uh, and we've done quite a bit of work recently on accents, especially with Adria. Uh, so I will focus mostly on tropins for which the story is a little bit more uh, complete. So let me tell you a little bit about plant tropism before, before jumping into the story of tropism. So the, the reason, so tropism is in direction to a stimulus, but if you don't have a stimulus, plant can also move. For instance, you, you, you know the Venus flytrap. This would be a case of thigmonastism. It means it's a respond, undirected response to a touch. I, we can all appreciate the, the plea of the, the poor wasp here. Um, but for tropism, uh, there is a response that's in the, that is related to the stimulus. For instance, phototropism, the corn seedling growing here, would respond when you turn on the light to the light itself in the direction of the light. The tropism can be positive, as in this case, it's positive phototropism, the, the seedling go to the, to the light, or you can talk about negative tropism. For instance, in the case of a, a shoot, the shoot goes in the direction opposite to gravity, where the roots have positive gravitropism, they go mostly in the direction of gravity. We talk also about tropism. It's not quite uh, correct from a, a terminology point of view, but it's the, the word that's accepted by the field. Uh, autotropism, which is a tendency for a plant to grow in a straight direction. This is an internal stimulus you can think about. And uh, another important one, that uh, word coined by Darwin, and we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about it, it's circumnutation. That is not a straight motion, but it has circular motion that many climbing plants exhibit. So now that we have uh, just set the, 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 general, um, the general topic, uh, I want to divide the rest of the talk into uh, mainly four parts. I first want to give you a brief history of plant tropism. You see how the evolution of the ideas have held shape or understanding of the phenomenon. So going back to antiquity, um, the first view of plants uh, pushed by uh, philosophers like Anaxagoras and then Pedocles and then Plato was that plants were sensitive. They have sensation, uh, both painful and, uh, and pleasant and also desire. And if you read Plato, you'll see that he described plant as having desire. Uh, by opposition, uh, uh, is a student, Aristotle, would think of plant as being insensitive. Um, 
And uh, in the anima, for instance, he thinks of humans as being rational, as animal as being sensitive, but vegetable as being non-sensitive, mostly nutritive. And this is also the, the point of view of his uh, student, Theophrastus, who did uh, extensive uh, study of plants. And here is a part of Theophrastus. You see uh, beautiful pea shoots uh, together with the tendrils. And we'll go back to tendrils here about the development of tendrils. And Theophrastus was the first to propose uh, an explanation for phototropism. And his idea was that phototropism is a purely uh, mechanical phenomenon where due to the light, the part of the plant would dry out and hence move uh, due to, the, to the, the change in fluids. So you'd see uh, between the two schools, between the Platonic and Aristotelian, a real dichotomy. On one hand, you have that plants are sensitive, maybe they have willpower, emotion, cognition. Uh, on the other hand, plants are, for Aristotle, plants are insensitive, the, phys the physical, and they have purely passive response, like heat or like other, other physical attributes. Uh, and this dichotomy uh, would still play uh, Will, will, will have, uh, uh, could be found through the entire history and still play today uh, with certain version about plant consciousness, a certain discussion about the topic. But in both cases, for both school, there is uh, what you will see a systematic use of animal plant analogy, depending whether you think that certain motion in animals are purely physical, then you would use that analogy to push, to push the idea about insensitivity. So fast forwarding for about 2000 uh, year, uh, the work of Gian, uh, Giambattista della Porta is very characteristic. Uh, on the one hand, he used the plant uh, animal analogy in his doctrine of signature, where for instance here, he look at an orchid and see how it resembles to a plant. And the doctrine of signature, as you may know, is the idea that uh, if a plant looks like an animal, then it can be used uh, to treat uh, any kind of ailment related to an animal. For instance, if you have a snake bite, you look for a plant that look like a snake uh, in order to treat it. But the idea of Giambattista, he was both a little bit a magician uh, but also a scientist, is that tropism is like magnetism. And he was the first to describe hydrotropism, the, the, the propensity of plant to go towards water. And his idea is that tropism is like magnetism, that there are certain elements that, uh, that create sympathy and, and attraction or repulsion uh, and uh, antipathy. So for instance, uh, a plant that would uh, bend towards the sun uh, would be in sympathy, would be attracted to the sun. There would be an attribute like that. On the other hand, on the other side of the coin, you have people like Francis Bacon, who really think about plants as being sensitive, and he described plants to that rejoice at the presence of the sun and mourn at the absence thereof. You see the, the word, the, the use of the word rejoice and mourn, so really attached to the feeling of the plant. But of course, moving on in the 17th century, uh, people like René Descartes uh, and both Descartes and Harvey really thought of uh, plants as being uh, uh, machines. Essentially, anything for Descartes was like hydraulic machine, except, of course, the soul and the mind. Uh, and certainly, plants were, were described as such. And Harvey used uh, his uh, understanding of the heart as a uh, pump. Uh, and, uh, and the vascular system uh, to try to explain phenomena that appears in plants. And by looking at worm and realizing that worms twitches even when you remove any kind of, of, of uh, a nervous system, uh, he thought of the reaction of plants as being uh, a non-cerebral process, but similar to the kind of reaction that you have from nerves. And a lot of discussion at the time was centered around this one wonderful plant, Mimosa pudica, sensitive mimosa. 
And uh, you probably know this one, but if you touch it here, for instance, right in the middle, if you whack it, what you will see is the plan actually closing on itself very quickly. Actually here, if you, if you touch it at the tip, you'll see a front moving from the tip to the base, uh, closing, and this is in real time. On, uh, unlike all the other movies I show you, this is in real time. So it was really puzzling. Uh, it was so puzzling that Charles II decided to ask the Royal Society for an explanation and a committee was established and the study. They did a series of uh, experiments eventually published by uh, Robert Hooke uh, in, a, in a wonderful book. So there was a, a lot of interest at the time about plant motion and going on the 18th century, of course, I'm, uh, I have to tell you about the contribution of uh, of uh, Linus or Linnei or Linneo, depending on how you want to, uh, to spell it or pronounce it. Um, of course, we'll go back uh, in a moment to Philosophia Botanica, published in 1751. In Philosophia Botanica, uh, uh, Linnaeus uh, study uh, plant sleep. Uh, and he dedicated an entire book, Somnus Plantarum, published in 1755, to the study of this phenomenon. And his son would go on and keep studying that. And I, I believe there is a manuscript that's part of the Linnean Society uh, that, that uh, is the work of uh, Linnaeus son on the topic. And there he described uh, both in Philosophia Botanica and Somnus Plantarum, 46 different species of what we would call nictinastic plants. So uh, plants that react to uh, the circadian rhythm. And this is another form of tropism or, or kind of form of tropism. It's a reaction to a stimulus, but non-directed, the fact that plants uh, close on themselves. And based on that, he had the idea to have a, a horologium florae, which means a, a floral clock that you could have with different plants opening and closing at different times. It never quite worked. Many people have been trying to do it, but due to the change of uh, plant behavior with uh, with the light and with the latitude. I don't think uh, we ever had a good uh, floral clock, but it was, it was a beautiful idea. Now, at the, about the same period, we have the first um, real experiment on phototropism, and these were done by Charles Bonnet uh, in uh, part of his uh, theory of plant irritability. And you see here the experiment, you take a plant and you tie it, and so, by itself, it would go completely down. And then you put it in the sun and you observe the way it uh, redirects itself towards the plant. It would also put plants in boxes with opening and see what's happening. So his idea was very much like Theophrastus. He says, well, the reason the plant start bending is that the heat of the plant dries the plant on one side and that's what caused the contraction. But um, actually, uh, it was at the same period, based on the same set of experiments, Henri-Louis Duhamel, that pro uh, who proposed the correct explanation that it was light and not heat, which is actually responsible for the motion. It's a beautiful book on the physics of tree. Of tree. Um, uh, for instance, you can see there uh, so certain uh, uh, figures where he studied in quite detail the uh, transpiration of plants, how much, how much, water, uh, how much water is uh, being released by the plant during, during uh, its life. Um, in the same book, you'll have the first uh, observation, experiment, an explanation of how roots grow and uh, the fact that they mostly uh, grow uh, by the tip. Uh, so that was also the first uh, quite remarkable book on uh, uh, for the time. Now, of course, uh, let me move to uh, something that's more close to us, the 19th century, with the work of uh, Darwin, Darwin, and Darwin. Uh, by that, I mean first Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Of course, Charles Darwin is the reference for all the family. So Erasmus Darwin was uh, quite interested in plan, and it's what uh, is known in plant philosophy, if you want, as a sensationalist. He really believed in sensitivity of plant, that uh, plants are sensitive organisms with voluntary power of motion. 
He also believed that plant buds contains a brain and that roots are like muscles and nerves. So he would really push the analogy. Uh, not quite very scientific work, but certainly some work that had some influence on the way Darwin thought about it. Now Darwin, uh, as, as you probably know, had quite an interest in plant. And uh, after he was mostly done with uh, origin of species and moving back to London and being quite to the south of London and being quite uh, ill, he did a series of work on, on plants, including the uh, on the movement and habits of climbing plant in 1875, the power of movement in plant in 1880, and in 1873, the first treatise on insectivorous plant, what we would call carnivorous plant now, uh, such as Drosera. And he was so fascinated by Drosera that in some letter to the, the great American uh, biologist, uh, Asa Gray, he wrote, I care more for Drosera than the origin of species. It's a, it is a wonderful plant, or rather a most sagacious animal, I will stick up for Drosera to the day of my death. You see, of course, botanists love that, that, that quote because it says, you know, this is more important than evolution after all in the eye of Darwin. Um, but also look at the, the plant-animal analogy, uh, the fact that uh, Darwin compared a plant to a sagacious animal. And indeed, in the movement of plant, he would go one step further, much a little bit like joining back to his uh, grandfather, and he would write, it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the tip of the root acts like the brain of one of the lower animals. Again, pushing that, uh, that analogy. His son, Francis Darwin, helped him uh, write the movement and plants. Um, more, a lot of the of drawings are from there. And he became uh, also quite a famous uh, uh, botanist. He was actually the first person to hold the title of professor of plant physiology. So more going from botany to, to plant physiology. So the work in the movement of plants is particularly important for a story because that was the first time that phototropism was really understood or the mechanism for phototropism was understood. So what uh, Darwin and Darwin did was that they understood that uh, phototropism, the fact that a plant wants to bend towards the, the light, uh, is uh, controlled by the tip of the plant. And the way they did it is that they, they realized that if you remove the tip, there is no bending. That if you uh, put a cap on an existing uh, 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 shoot, it would not bend either. But if the cap is transparent, then it would, that, then it, it would bend. But if, and if you cover the base of the, of, of, the, of the plant, it would still bend. And they concluded that the information was carried from the tip to the rest of the plant. And they assumed that there would be some sort of substance that would, what we call diffuse or be transported uh, from the tip to the rest of the plant. And that was the start really for a lot of work related that uh, culminated in the world of colony and vent in the beginning of the 20th century. And what they did was very, inge really ingenious. What they did was expose a plant to light, but cut the tip and then take the tip and allow the tip to diffuse to a block of agar. So whatever was in in the, in the tip would diffuse there and just apply the tip a different place on a shoot and see it bend. And the idea was again that if there is a substance here that's being sent by the tip, it would change the way the plant bent. And what they assume is that this substance would change the elongation uh, in response to a certain plant hormone that was uh, identified by Tiemann uh, uh, Vent in 1934 as being oxin. And this really led to the main discovery of uh, probably the 20th century, as far as plant is concerned, is the role of plant hormone, in particular oxin, uh, for the motion and development of plants. So the way we understand phototropism now is that the tip a special receptor uh, that are specially attuned to blue light that the stimulus would create a difference in oxygen concentration and that difference in oxygen concentration would be transported and would change differentially cell expansion. So what is the process, what is the physical mechanism that makes this plant move one way or the other? 
Well, it's what is referred generally in plants as differential growth. That means that one side grows more than the other one, but it's a purely physical phenomenon. For instance, if you have two uh, uh, metallic strips but with different uh, thermal expansion coefficient, uh, well, if you heat them, just like we're doing here that in, this, uh, in this movie, uh, one would grow faster or would, would expand more than the other one. But since they're attached together, the internal stresses in the, in, in the, the structure make it bend. And it's a process that was fully understood uh, and uh, a theory was established by the great engineer Timoshenko in 1925. Uh, so the idea, or at least for bimetallic strip, is that if I tell you, if I know the coefficient of expansion and the temperature, I would be able to find the curvature how much, how much that strips curve. And the same physics is at work in plants as I'm going to show you in a moment. But before going there, I wanna go back quickly in the, in the 19th century, because whereas the work on, of Darwin was very influential for phototropism, uh, the German school was quite different. Uh, Julius von Sachs, Gottlieb Aberland, Muller, were all very well established plant physiologists and very important treaties such as the lecture on physiology of plant. And in there you find quite a very different philosophy of science, of plant science than the one of, uh, of Darwin. Darwin is very much uh, um, attached to observation, cultivating many plants, looking at how they behave, uh, thinking about evolution, thinking about be, uh, uh, behavior. But uh, uh, Sachs and Aberland and the, uh, the German school were very much uh, uh, really wanted to establish a quantitative theory of plants. And in the book, you'll find uh, computation, calculus, you'll find uh, integral, you'll find differential equation, you'll find uh, uh, discussion about polarization of light. So really the physics of the matter, a lot of quantification, a lot of measurement. So they were not quite happy with uh, with Darwin, the fact that Darwin was coming on the, on the turf. And uh, in the lecture on the physiology of plants, indeed Julius von Sachs remark, I find myself with regard to this book about the power and movement of plants in the most painful position and can only regret that the name of Charles Darwin appears on it. And the, the main criticism is that it was not uh, experimental enough. Uh, interestingly, the criticism about phototropism was not justified. It was really uh, uh, pushed a little too much by, by von Sachs. All the criticism, uh, uh, mostly the fact that almost all type of motion have, have some form of circumnutation that was also advanced by, by Darwin are more justified. But in the physiology of plants, you'll find uh, uh, a lot of work related not to phototropism, but gravitropism. And understanding of gravitropism uh, come from, from, from that school. And for instance, um, uh, Sachs uh, invented an apparatus called the clinostat, uh, in which you put a plant and you, you rotate the plant and see how it behaves. And depending on the rotation, you would, uh, you would expect different type of, of, of motion or the way the plant who go back to uh, uh, go back to being vertical. There's a lot of very nice little device you can you can build in order to try to trick uh, a plant and establish some form of gravity. For instance, if you if you put a plant on a wheel and rotate it, then you create a force that uh, the that the plant feels like gravity. In the same way, uh, with people have done experiment by sending uh, plants uh, to remove gravity. So ex they are experiment uh, in, uh, in space and they experiment on, moon or on the moon. So out of the work of Sachs, what is our understanding of uh, gravitropism? Well, again, it's the idea is to really go back and look at the real tip of the plant. So here is Arabidopsis, the, the model plant uh, for genetics. And if you go there, uh, what you'll observe is that 
uh, there are specialized cells that contain this little granule here. And if you further focus, you'll find that these cells that are called statocyte contains little uh, starch granules that are called statolith. And that's an observation first made by, uh, by Sachs, I believe. And when the, t when the plant change orientation, they move with the plant. For instance, here is a movie where we all of a sudden we turn the plant and you can see the reorientation, the motion of the starch granule within, within the plant. So what happens is that as they change the place of where they are within the cell, within the status site, they, they create, um, they create a, a reaction uh, to the plant. The cell will react and change the way it, um, it uh, transport oxygen. So in the middle of the root, you have a normally a flow of oxygen and you have a fountain. If the, if the root is vertical, you have a fountain where it comes from the middle and then it's recirculated to, the, to both sides. But because of T cell, the way it's distributed on both sides differs and we have a good understanding now all the different mechanisms so that there is a higher flow of oxygen on one side than the other one. And just like for phototropin, this difference in oxygen will create differential growth. So I'll go back in the process uh, of how it, how it works, uh, how it creates this growth in, in a second. So uh, I've told you about phototropism um, as a reaction mostly driven by the tip. Um, gravitropism for roots also at the tip, but for a normal plant, a plant that you would just change, the, the cells that can react to the gravity are all uh, all along the shoot, not just at the at the root, like for for, for at the tip, like for roots. So uh, both are related to some form of differential uh, flow of oxygen that create differential growth. So now our goal is to try to go a little bit further and zoom out and try to understand if we can go from this mechanism to actually understanding the full shape of the plants. But in order to do that, we have to uh, talk a little bit about shape. If I want to take a, a shape, um, I, I need the right language. So just like Linnaeus established the right language to talk about different species with taxonomy, we have to establish some taxonomy for uh, shapes. So let's start with a very simple case where we have a curve in two dimension. So imagine it's sufficiently smooth, no kink or anything like that. And what I can do is I can look at one point, take this point here, for instance, P, and I can uh, look at the best fitting circle. What is the circle that, that fits the, more, the best there? And I can compute its radius R. And from its radius, I will define the curvatures as being the inverse of that radius. And the idea is that curvature is a much better mathematical object than radius. For instance, uh, if uh, the radius is infinite, the curvature is zero, and that would correspond to a straight line. It's much easier to deal with a straight line being zero curvature than uh, infinite radius of curvature. So uh, mathematically, it makes more sense to use the curvature as, as the main object. Now, if I look at another point called P prime here, I can fit another circle. This circle is smaller. So the radius R is, uh, is smaller and the curvature is larger. And the idea that curvature is uh, it's a quantification, is a measure of how tight the curve is at some point. Now, mathematically you can prove, and that was done probably in the 19th century or before, that uh, there is a very interesting result. If I give you a curve, I can look at every point and do this circle construction and find a curvature. So from the curve, I can compute the curvature at every point. But the fundamental theorem of uh, curves in the plane tells you that if I know the curvature, I can also, uh, I can also find the curve up to a translation and a rotation that's not important for the shape of the curve. So if I give you curvature at all point along the length, I can find the shape of the curve. 
the curvature is enough to fully describe the shape of the curve. So there is a very nice uh, simple uh, application of that. It's called the sign law in plant physiology. And it's the idea that the way the curvature change in time, so the rate of curvature change, that's the derivative of the curvature with respect to time, rate of curvature change, is related to the angle at each point with respect to the vertical. So if alpha is zero, sine of alpha is zero, and there is no change. That's the case where the, the, the plant is fully upright, fully vertical. If the plant is completely horizontal, then sine alpha is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, one, hence the curvature will change very quickly. And this is the motion you see. And for instance, this is, uh, this is a, a figure from uh, uh, the book from Sachs. Okay, so that's about curvature in the plane. But of course, plants don't stay in the, in the plane. Uh, they like to explore the full three-dimensional environment. So curvature are not quite enough. What we need, it's also torsion. And torsion tells you how the, how the plan uh, explore different planes and how quickly they explore different planes. So I can still fit a, um, I can still fit a circle at every point on my curve, but the way the plane in which this circle fit will give me the torsion of the curve. And so I have these two notion, curvature and torsion, now the equivalent fundamental theorem of differential geometry of curve tells you that if I know curvature and torsion, I, I can find the full shape of the plan. So the message here is very simple. All I need to describe this complicated shape in three dimension, really intrinsically, it's its curvature and torsion. So let's go a little bit more in the taxonomy. Let's see if we understood. If I have no torsion and no curvature, I have a straight curve. If I have no torsion but curvature, I have a ring, essentially. I have a, a circle. If I have a constant torsion and curvature, so let's say both positive, I have a helix. What about if I change the sign of the torsion? Well, I have a helix, like a slinky, but of the other chirality. This one is a right-handed helix, and this one is a left-handed helix. And why do I call it right-handed helix and left-handed helix? Well, there is a convention in physics that if you put your thumb in the middle of the axis, depending which way it turns, whether or not I use my left hand or right hand, I would follow naturally the helix. So I use my own body to decide what, what is right-handed and what is left-handed. And that by itself is quite interesting and subject of another story. Uh, as Feynman says, we know the right hand rule. That's what we use. That's what we teach uh, at school and at university. But he says, Feynman says, it was merely a convention. It was a trick. So where does this trick come? And you, you like the story because it's going to bring us back to the story of plants. Well, the story really, the, the convention really stemmed from the work of Maxwell. Maxwell uh, call a special meeting of the London Mathematical Society, not very far from where the Linnean Society is, in 1871. And he says, in pure mathematics, little inconvenience is felt from the one of uniformity. But in astronomy, electromagnetics, and all physical sciences, it is of the greatest importance that one or the other system, or the other system should be specified. He says, we have to decide what we call left and what we call right, right? And the society concluded that uh, it was written in that uh, little uh, popular science journal, Nature, in May 1871, that the right-handed system, the one that I just told you about, uh, symbolized, by a, uh, symbolized by a coarse screw or the tendril of the vine was adopted by the society. So if I take a coarse screw, you see this is a right-handed helix. I put my, my right my right and the thumb in there, I can turn, I would follow the, the words of the helix. But what about the tendril of the vine? Well, if you look in the book on climbing plant by Darwin, you realize that tendril are both left-handed and right-handed. That's another story I can tell you another day, but there is good reason for that. Tendrils never have a single right-handed or left-handed. So, 
the definition of Maxwell is not quite clear, especially for somebody who really want a precise definition. And indeed, if you look at presumably what is one of the most important treaties of physics of all time, uh, the treaties of electricity and magnetism by Maxwell in 1892 that unify the uh, that, that's really the birth of electromagnetism. He says in a footnote in the very first pages, Professor Miller, Professor Miller was a crystallographer at uh, Cambridge at the time. Professor Miller suggested to me that as the tendril of the vine are right-handed screws and tools of the hop left-handed, the two systems might be called tools of the vine and the hop respectively. The system of the vine which we adopt is that of Linnaeus and of screw maker in all civilized countries except Japan. So there is a lot to unpack there in that little footnote. First, it talks about tendrils of the vine being right-handed screw. Not, that's not quite right. I show you the, the tendrils are neither left-handed or right-handed. The hop of the other case is a climbing plant with a well-defined uh, handedness as I'm going to show you. Now, it talks about uh, screws, uh, about screw from all civilized countries except Japan. So indeed, if you take a screw, normal screws are all right-handed. You see it's going, the, the world, the helical, the helical threat is going on the right. That's how you can recognize as being right-handed. I've never been able to find, uh, even in Japan when I visited, whether or not they had in the 19th century left-handed screws. Eskimos, it turns out Eskimo use left-handed screw because that's a, there's a good reason for that, the way they make it. But the definition is not bad. But what about Linus? He seems quite convinced that he would adopt the convention of Linus. So it's time for us to go back to Philosophia Botanica, a fa favorite book, 1751, and see what Linus had to say about uh, handedness. And indeed, very nice, very nicely defined. Page 39, you find a figure. He says, look at the figure 115. This is a spiral. And his parallel is left-handed sinistrosum, right? With a little moon here that you see. Uh, it says like the hop, like humulus, which is the hop. It says indeed, it's, uh, it's completely right. Uh, but they're also right-handed plan, like convolvulus. Convolvulus is bindweed. You, you might have that in your garden. And uh, it's a right-handed structure very well defined, as you would expect from the great master. Page 103, he repeats the definition. He says, left is hop, perfect, and uh, right is uh, bindweed, convolvulus, perfect. no problem, completely consistent. However, in a later edition of the book, he has an erratum. And the erratum, you see that he says in page 103, Whenever you, you, you read left, you should read right. Replace sinistro room by dextra. Repeat left by right. But he doesn't say anything about page 39. And that was the source of much confusion from uh, after the book from the 18th, 19th century. And depending on the way you read the both the erratum and which page you look at, you would call this plan left-handed, like Linnaeus, Gray, Darwin, and so on, or right-handed, like De Cordol, Von Moll, Biscoff, and back. So with many different description, uh, uh, all different type of de definition, like it's left view from outside, but it's right view from inside, or it follow the course of the sun, or it's like the hand of a watch, but do you look at the watch from the top or from the bottom, and so on. So. There was a lot of confusion, and you see that the desire of Darwin to uh, of uh, Maxwell to use a good definition for what is left and right-handed was not quite uh, achieved by by looking at plants. Okay, now we've set the scene. Uh, we've understand the mechanism. I want to tell you about a theory of tropism, but let me tell you what I mean by a theory. Uh, so in physics, what you would expect from a theory, uh, let's say the theory of celestial motion, is that if I give you the position and the velocity of planets, I would be able, through the theory of uh, uh, universal gravitation, to find, in principle, the position of the planets at all later time. So what is the equivalent for us? 
Well, for me, what I really want is a theory that tells me if I know the characteristic of the plant and I know the stimuli that the plant is exposed to and how it grows, I want to be able to find in time the shape and the dynamics of the plant. And of course, this is quite a difficult problem, apart the fact that biology is very difficult and there are a lot of different mechanisms implied. Uh, even in the simplest case, it's difficult. And why it's difficult is because it relies on many different types of science that are traditionally separated. Uh, the challenge for a theory of tropism is that, as I told you, it has to include oxygen transport. It has to include transport of chemical uh, substance and probably a chemical pathway also. So, so it rely, really relies on chemistry or biochemistry and the transport theory. But I also want the plants, since plants evolve in three dimensions, to be a full, the theory to be fully three dimensional in dynamics. So I really need the tools of differential geometry that I show you for the description of shape in three dimensions. I know that there are large forces that are developed at the level of plant, relatively large force, because they, they lead to large deformation, the large motion, the large deformation of the plant. And for that, I need continuum mechanics. Now, I want to include things like gravity, because that's important for the plant. I want to include contact, I want to include light. So that's all physics. I want also to include growth and remodeling. So I have to adapt the typical physical theory to uh, uh, a theory of uh, structure that can also grow and change its internal properties. And finally, I want to integrate multiple stimuli because a plant is not subject just to the light or just to gravity, but continuously to multiple stimuli. And that's where things become interesting. So what is the idea, the main idea that um, mostly contained in a published that uh, in a paper published uh, with uh, Derek Moulton and Adrien uh, uh, last year. The main idea is that uh, a plant will receive a stimulus, let's say light, for instance, let's think about light, and that by the mechanism that I described, uh, oxygen will be redistributed at different places in the plant. So assuming I can find or I can find a concentration of oxygen. That change in concentration of oxygen will induce, as I told you, differential growth at the level of the tissue. If I see it as a whole, there's an cha internal change in that. And I want to reduce that, this what happened at the, the local level to a one dimension, to a single curve, so that I can extract the curvature and torsion that I told you about, the one that characterized the shape, the overall shape of the plant. Because once I do that, I can compute, I can compute its new equilibria, its new equilibrium, and uh, fully uh, integrate the stimulus. So once I have this one dimensional curvature, I can actually find the full shape of the plant. And since the plant position or the cell at each point change with respect to the stimulus, the distribution of oxygen will change again and I will have to go around. So let me try to develop that a little bit and then I'll, I'll show you some nice application to this idea. So the first point is to try to model uh, oxygen flow. I'm assuming that I have a stimulus, for instance, in this case, gravity, and that gravity will change the way oxygen is redistributed uh, in the plant. Or if I have uh, tip growth here, I have a flow of oxygen that's going to flow differentially at the two points. In order to do that, I can define oxygen to be uh, uh, to have a certain concentration. And we know from both chemistry and physics that uh, 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 oxygen, uh, a simple model for oxygen will be that it would diffuse through the material following a diffusion equation where J is a flux due to the difference in concentration of oxygen. Also assume that there is an uptake of oxygen, and that's we know because it's redistributed to the core, and that there is natural production also of oxygen in my system. Uh, never mind about the equation, I'll just flash a few equations. The important for you is really to understand the overall meaning or the fact that we can 
we can actually compute uh, the uh, concentration of oxygen quite precisely once we have the equation. I assuming fixed law, that's pure diffusion, and the flux, the flux that is created. And here is the, where the stimulus is important. The fact that I have a difference in flux created at the tip. Now, what is the mechanism that relate oxygen to cell growth? Well, in normal cell, in normal plant cell, due to difference in solute with respect to the, uh, the outside of the cell, the cell, the cell might pump up uh, uh, water uh, in order to balance osmotic pressure created by the difference in solute by its turgor pressure. And the result is that it might be an extension of the overall cell. Now, oxygen will come and acidify the cell wall and remodel the cell wall so that it is now in a new shape that is, that doesn't, um, that is not stretched. So imagine you have a balloon, you stretch it, but once it's stretched, you remove the stretch by adding a lot of material within the balloon. And so the new shape is now a permanent, a permanent shape. And even if you remove if you, if you don't have a, a difference of solute, if you don't have osmotic pressure, it will keep that shape. So water can come. Without oxygen, the water can flow in and out. But with oxygen, what happens is when the cell is extended, it will keep its extension even when the stimulus is removed. So imagine that I have a bunch of cells. This is a very nice uh, uh, stim uh, stimulation by uh, another group. Uh, and you have a lot of cells with different extension. For instance, cell on this side of the shoot would grow faster than this one. So what you would expect is that you see this cell grow faster, that overall you would create curvature. Now, this is a process uh, that you can simulate uh, by looking at cell-cell interaction and it's very uh, in a very detailed way. Another way, which is much more uh, at the tissue level, without looking at the detail of the tissue, is to think of the, of the entire shoot, so the stem, as a single continuum and use a, a more general theory for growth that does not rely uh, on simulation, on, on, on direct computer simulation. So there is a theory that uh, I've been developed with a collaborator over the last 20 years that, uh, uh, that allows us to compute the deformation that are due to growth within a material, within a biological material. And the theory is, is explained in, in, uh, in a book I published a few years ago about it. I don't want to go into the detail. Again, this would be another, another full discussion. But the main point is that a local change due to a cell expansion would create a global change of shape. And that global change of shape we can fully capture. Now, what happened at the tissue level, um, we have differential growth. One side is growing faster than another one. Let's say it is one on the right is growing faster than the one on the left. But what I'm really interested in is it's very difficult to create to compute the full, the full uh, uh, shape of the plan like that. So the idea is to reduce, to average the different force and stresses acting on, on this due to the change in, uh, to the differential growth to a single one dimensional theory. And that's another piece of mathematics that I've been developed over the, over the last few years with Thomas Lessing, who is now a faculty in Belgium, and again, Derek. Uh, and we have a paper just related to the mathematics of that process. Or to go from three dimension, so what happened at the microscopic level, zoom out and obtain the curvature and the torsion of a, a filament uh, structure. So again, the basic idea is that at the level, we can define point-wise what growth does, and we can solve the problem by finding the curvature and the torsion that the plan would like to adopt, ideally. Now, once we have that, it means that a local change in volumes creates change of curvature and torsion that we can fully compute mathematically. Now, let me put that all together. I told you a stimulus of uh, induced oxygen transport, differential oxygen transport. 
that a change of volume element is related to a flow of auxin, that the local change of volume creates a global change in shape, but that global change in shape is related to curvature and torsion that we can, we can compute. And then we can compute a new shape. So that's in word. Let me go back to the picture again here. We first compute the change, the flow of auxin. The flow of auxin is going to do a local change at the cell level. And the cell level, we can integrate the change of the cell level in order to capture the curvature and torsion of the entire structure. Now, that curvature and torsion, since the plane also feels gravity or could be in contact, is not the final shape, it's the optimal, it's the shape the plant would like to adopt. Um, by like, I mean that from a, a physical point of view is an energy minimizer, but due to external constraint, the plant might have a different shape, for instance, due to its own weight. And that can be computed through normal tools of uh, mechanics. And so we have different set of equations that describe different type of physical or chemical process that takes place within the plant, typically with different, uh, uh, different time scale. And you see here is really the, the difficulty that one has when doing, uh, trying to do a theory in biology is that unlike physics where uh, a lot of problems have uh, scales that are separated, for instance, if you look at the, the motion of planet, you don't have to worry about the atmosphere or the ocean and things like that. In biology, you really have to integrate this different scale, both in time and space, in order to understand the behavior of the overall organism. And this is still the main reason why we don't have uh, overall a full uh, mathematical theory of biology the same way that we have for many physical processes. Now, as I promise, I wanna spend the, the remaining time uh, to look at some application uh, let's start with phototropism. So for phototropism, I have um, I have a tip of the plan. I imagine that I have a unit vector E uh, directed towards the sun. The stimulus, the auxin is going to be produced at the tip. It's going to depend on the orientation on this vector, the way the plant is oriented towards towards the sun. So it's really going to uh, depend on uh, the decomposition of this vector within the frame of reference of the plan. And based on that, you can balance the growth rate and the transport rate, and it leads to a new law that gives you curvature and torsion as a function of transport and position. I'm not gonna go through the law. I mean, I, you, I just wanted to flash it to show that actually it's not, it's not like five page of strange algebraic terms. It's, it's actually a very nice differential equation containing various terms that you can compute and run on your computer. But once you have that, you can actually go to the computer and say, okay, now assume that I have a plan here and by the same law that I show you, the plan wants to respond to the sun here, but the sun moves during the day. And so this is my equivalent of, of my heliotropum, if you want, or my water nymph or the way it would follow Helios through the day for nine days. And you see, you have a bit of autotropism. At night, the plant goes back straight up. And that's also part of the model. You combine different, different form of, of tropism. Okay, now let me show you gravitropism. So in the case of gravitropism, Again, the basic idea is that the stimulus, the way the plants see the vector of the gravity vector, gravity is a force, a force is a vector, depends on the orientation of the plant. When the plant bends, it sees the gravity differently. Imagine you are in the plants and you're following, you're following the, the stem, depending on the curvature of the sense, it will feel the gravity differently. And out of that, you can create, a, you can obtain a very nice law that relates, notice you are actually the generalized form of curvature that you need to the orientation of the plant. Uh, in the limit where you go back in the plane in two dimension, you rediscover or you recover the sign law that I show you and that was uh, found by Sachs originally. 
Okay, but now that we have a full general law, you can have much more fun. Uh, you can try to uh, simulate a plant that would be not in the plane, that would be rotating uh, uh, as, as it grows. So you can start with a very fast rotation. And if you have very fast rotation, what happens is that the plant really doesn't see the gravity because the, gra the rotation is so fast that it doesn't really have a time to react to the stimulus in the right direction. And so it essentially stays straight. However, if you have fast but not so fast rotation, then the plant starts reacting to gravity, but not completely. Now, if you have a slow rotation, the plant reacts very quickly to gravity, but then sees the rotation and sees that it's in the wrong direction. And then you can really see that if you have very slow rotation, you see when you have very slow rotation, the plant directly goes back up, but then you turn it and it tries to reorient itself. And the point here is that right away, just with a single tropism like that, you see extremely complicated shape and motion that can arise from that. Now, you can, we can go back to Darwin and look at thigmotropism or the way a climbing plant would grow around. The problem with the climbing plant is as it grows, it has to create curvature when it's in contact with uh, its pole, with, with a cylinder, for instance. Here is a very nice movie by Wendy Silk uh, in California. We studied this, this type of problem for a long time. And again, the idea is that if oxygen is produced at the point of contact, then you would have a differential, uh, differential flow of oxygen that would create the correct type of curvature. Now, I've shown you uh, individual form of tropism, phototropism, gravitropism, stigmotropism. Now, the theory that we propose, or the part of the theory that we propose, is uh, you can easily accommodate multiple stimuli. And we are now in very interesting position where we can think ab about now real behavior of a plant. If you take behavior as a general, uh, with a general definition or definition that it's a coordinated response to multiple external stimuli of a living organism, there is no reason that you cannot describe the behavior of plant. For instance, canopy escape when plants have to find the light when, or over the canopy is an example of a combination of phototropism and gravitropism. And here, the plants, if it was gravitropism by itself, the plant would grow, but will be stuck to the canopy. Now the plant see the diffusing light here, so it grows one way, and as soon as it escapes, the two uh, the two stimuli align, both both gravity and and the light align, and the plant grows. And the plants actually also get in contact here, so you do have to take into account contact mechanics in time. It's also important. So it's a full mechanical object. You cannot just think purely in terms of its shape, it's a shape, but it creates force by contact with other objects. And so going back to Darwin, um, you see now how he understood or what he was thinking about plants, about uh, behavior of plants. Uh, he says that intelligence, that's of course one way of thinking about intelligence, is based on how efficient a species become at doing the things they need to survive. And clearly in the case of plan, combining different uh, tropic responses uh, in order to maximize its chance to survive is a form of behavior. Here is another one uh, we call pole dancing. So it combines circumnotation, which is the motion that is described by Nowin, you know, the, 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 this uh, spiral motion of the plant as it grows, together with stigmotropism. As soon as it finds the, the pole, it has to, uh, it has to start uh, climbing the pole. And that circumnutation is not in, uh, doesn't do that. So the way we, we see it, we have a plant that's naturally has circumnutation. It's looking for, if you think of behavior, it's looking for a pole. And once it's find a pole, it starts, stigmotropism is uh, starting 
it starts climbing the pole as you've seen before. In a way, this is really a form of uh, uh, primitive behavior, but you can see that through evolution, it's very easy to change these different weight of response of different stimuli. And any organism that can respond to multiple stimuli uh, can uh, quickly evolve by changing the way or the combination of the response to stimuli. So uh, let me conclude. What I try to show you is that um, we have a theory, a fragment of a theory, I would say, that connect tissue to organ uh, for tropism. Clearly, uh, we need a little more, but this theory already integrates local stimuli dynamically. It produces complex behavior. You, you can really go. Um, and it provides what I would call a field theory of plant tropism in the same sense that electromagnetism is a theory of fields, the fields being the magnetic and electric fields. Here, the fields are gravity fields, stress fields, and all fields, uh, scalar field like oxygen concentration. You relate mathematically different fields to explain the phenomena of plant tropism. I said it's a fragment of a, a theory. Um, the same ideas applies to other active structure. Uh, it applies to axons, we've been looking, but it applies to much more complicated one. Essentially, the mechanics or the physics of this object is not that different. You have active response uh, changing the internal structure of this filament that respond to certain stimuli, either internal or external. It's a fragment of a theory in the sense that any kind of biological theory or theory that aims to explain biology ultimately has to be able to relate to the uh, genes and to the genome uh, on, one, on one hand and on the other side to evolution. So you, know, you have to bridge all these scales. Um, so there is still a lot of work to do in order to understand how a signal, for instance, a mechanical signal is transduced all the way down from the tissue down to the cell, down to a, a, a response that is due to the gene and up to back to the tissue or, or cell react to change in the environment. Uh, but these are the kind of things that we now have a framework in which we can uh, implement them and think about them. But the theory is also easily adapted for particular experiments. And now we're looking with a different experimental group into uh, fitting these or validating more systematically certain uh, response of plants. Um, and finally, I want also again to mention uh, the role of the collaborative work with both uh, Derek and Adria. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you very much, Alan. That was absolutely fascinating. I mean, imagine linking all of that stuff up and I think um, we can see how it how how so much can be modeled mathematically is so interesting. OK, so there have been a few questions and I think there'll be more coming now because it's it's quite hard to concentrate and ask and think of questions at the same time. First of these is um, Ian was wondering um, when plant when the plant tropism is is activated or switched on. And I think this is something you just alluded to at the, in your very last comments. Um, are there any studies on just plant cells, like on protoplasts or, or, or bits of tissue culture? It, does it have to do with the whole plant or, or it's that so, gene, to, gene to tissue thing? Yeah, so, so there are cells like uh, phycomyces, which are unicellular, for which uh, you can identify five different types of stimuli. So you can, I, you know, in fungi, you can identify exactly the stimuli on a single cell. Uh, for plant, you really need to look at the uh, multicellular response in order to understand, because a lot is due to this uh, uh, control flux of auxin between uh, one cell to the next one, so transport of information. So just identifying, extracting one cell will not tell you that much, because mm -hmm. it's really uh, in its ability to react to its, uh, its neighbor that it creates the effect that you want to do. But of course, there's been there's been numerous studies of uh, at the cellular level of the response of uh, of uh, for different stimuli, uh, certainly for phototropism and gravitropism, but it only makes sense in a multicellular environment. 
except for the species. I mean, there's, as I said, there's species, unicellular species that also react to different stimuli and that you can identify purely on them. But for plants, uh, the effect, the overall effect is really better understood in a multicellular context. So does that mean does that mean that the bit that for a for a unicellular organism something different might be going on or is it just a, an extension of that multicellularity down to the unicellular level? Well, so I'm, I would say for multicellular organisms, the the ability to uh, uh, react as a whole, as macroscopically, mm -hmm. is limited. Right? It might be more related to motion or uh, to uh, food searching and all that. But uh, you probably need the complexity of multicellularity to uh, uh, to uh, to exhibit more rich responses. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so somebody has asked: um, Can left or right-handed tropisms differ on the same plant depending on whether the plant is in the northern or southern hemisphere? Is there anything to I, this thing about? Yeah, I, I, I love that question. And when you read the old books like the Condol and all that, they all wonder about that. Mm -hmm. um, so. The response is no, there is no effect. And the reason is physically, if you, uh, if you compute the relative force, you realize that the force the, due to Coriolis effect are negligible. Um, and that, uh, and, and it cannot have possibly any effect. So that's if you're a physicist, it's convincing. If you're a biologist, it's not convincing. And there have been studies that showing that uh, there is no effect. People have tried to grow plants and different, at the, and you obtain exactly what you would expect from the physical argument. The same is true, actually, for the way the world, uh, the, when you empty your sink, this is, there is no real Coriolis effect unless you do all, almost perfect experiment. This is all due mm -hmm. to initial, uh, great uh, story, initial imperfection. <laughs> It's a great, it's a great, but it's, a, it's a great question. And people, I mean, it's, it's remarkable people in 19th century or in, in his books have thought about that. They were, I wonder about this, this mm -hmm. type of question. They're natural. You look for a difference and, and there. Uh, most species uh, climbing plant are either left-handed or right-handed. A few, a few can be both depending on the condition. Mm -hmm. I was going to, I was going to say um, it from, from looking at some of the some of the old literature that you were showing, it looks like some things can be both right-handed and left-handed. Yeah. And I've definitely seen right right-handed. Yeah. But I think so, something same. like ninety-five percent of the species, I think, if I remember correctly, are mm -hmm. either one or the other one. There are very few species that that can that can exhibit both. The, it's a, it's another very interesting question, actually. Where does the handedness originate from at the most uh, cellular level? And that, that looks like it's due to some asymmetry in microtubules. So it might be all the way down to the protein. It's better understood. They're very nice uh, genetic experiment trying to, to show that. There's still a lot of work from a mechanical, a physical perspective to try to really relate the asymmetry or chirality that you see at the chemical level. The fact that the, the molecule that you work, the protein that you work are chiral, all the way down to the shape of the of the spiral shape of uh, of the roots or the or the stem, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, um, somebody's asked 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 a kind of a sort of um, a flower arranging question: Is to keep a book a bunch of tulips upright, so the stems stay <laughs> upright in a vase. You pierce the stem horizontally with a pin just below the flower, and it doesn't bend. Could you explain that? <laughs> I, I didn't know, and I'm the worst gardener. I barely managed to keep. Well, uh, I know, but I put keep, I put pennies to, to in keep my, my plants alive. Yeah, uh, and I, no, I put I, pennies in. I put pennies in my tulips to keep them from flopping over. That has to do well, with. I, I I I didn't even know that, and I think it's interesting. I'll try to think yeah. about that and and try I think to, a little experiment to, of, of pins. But, yeah, and thank you for like thank it. you for for the for the idea. <laughs> Uh, uh, the only the only plants that I managed to keep alive are the one that I, I don't try to do anything. They seem to be good by themselves. That's yeah, that's always that's always a good sign. <laughs> I was wondering that. Um, okay, so many plants that have tendrils, the tendrils kind of go along spiraling, and then there'll be a, a break where it's yeah. straight for a little while, yeah. and then it spirals the other direction. Yeah. So yeah. so what what governs that? Well, so it, it's a it, that's a beautiful story. Also, it also goes the story of how it was understood. To go all the way back to Ampère, the French physicist, was one of the first to write a letter to the Academy. Darwin talked about it in the the the, the mm -hmm. uh, in his book, 
uh, and I've worked in the past 20 years ago on that problem, trying to understand. You have to imagine that you start with a straight filament and the curvature, it wants to be curved. So the tendril explore by circumnutation attach itself to a certain, uh, to a tree or to a pole. And it wants to create by once, okay, forgive me about the expression I know. That's okay. That. It's okay. okay, ideally it creates a structure that is optimal for certain aspects, blah, 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 blah. So I would say it wants to create a spring. That's a, that's a Darwin, that, uh, the spring will allow it not to break uh, during wind and things like that. But the two ends are attached. So if you imagine that you have an arm and, 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 and hold a pole, then uh, you cannot create a spring by turning one hand of the other one because the two are, the two are, are, are fixed. Mm -hmm. And so the way it does it is that it builds intrinsic curvature. Um, and that was something that was understood at the end of the, of, of the 19th uh, century. Um, it builds intrinsic curvature by having one side growing faster than the other one. And you can show that the result of the combined tension with the buildup of intrinsic create, uh, uh, curvature creates two helices at the same time. So if you pull the tendril, you see that it's a, it's a straight filament. And as you pull it back together, it creates two springs, one left-handed and right-handed, that annihilates the, the, the overall twist of, of the, the system. So if you have one, your arm, you would, you would take the middle of the arm and turn it, and it would create on one side a, a left-handed spiral and on the other side a right-handed spiral. Well, that's really interesting. That's interesting. It was solved so early on. Um, Sarah's asked, would, tre would trees be accessible to this sort of analysis? Could you do the same kind of analysis? The trees are wonderful, but they're also extremely uh, complicated. Some of the principles that we look apply for trees, but in trees you have a lot of other effects. You have secondary growth, you have an overall balance of uh, uh, branches that change depending on the season. Uh, again, it's a nice problem of mechanics. Um, so there's certain idea that apply there, but also much more complexity and interest in, in uh, mm -hmm. uh, even before trees. I mean, another interesting system is what happens when you put multiple plants together, of course. I mean, I've told you about the single one, the way it reacts, but we know now that plants also respond to the neighbors and arrange themselves with kind of global uh, emergent properties that depends on the forces that are created by, by the neighbors. Think about a, a field of wheat or something like that, where you the have a canopy, lot of contact. The canopy of a rainforest where none of the, none of the canopies touch. <laughs> They're always just a perfect puzzle. It's extraordinary. Lying on, the, lying on the floor of a rainforest and looking up, as you can see that, that the trees don't touch one another. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's extraordinary. So, well, we've had many comments in the chat saying how much people appreciated the kind of the, the really clear way in which you explained such complicated ideas. It was absolutely fascinating, great diagrams. And I'm sure I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again to really kind of take it in. But Alan, thank you so much for the lecture this evening. And um, I'm really anxious to see what happens next how you get to that tissue to sell to genome and, and start doing all of those experiments. What, what plants are you working with? Um, uh, well, so, yes. Yeah, so we have, we have collaborator in Germany and uh, they're looking at different model organs. I mean, typically they are a little sad, you know, but they're, they're, they're well controlled like Arabidopsis. But more recently we started uh, uh, an interesting uh, new collaboration going back to carnivorous plants talking with people at the Oxford Botanical Garden, uh, working on Nepenthes, which is fascinating also by itself. So yeah. now we, we're trying to understand aspect of, uh, aspect of mechanics of related to uh, uh, carnivorous plants. Yeah, we had, a, we had a lecture about, I don't know, some, some months ago about the, elect uh, about the electrical impulses and the whole way Nepenthes work as well. So go back mm -hmm. on YouTube and have a look at that one. I will well, certainly do that. Thank you so much for coming along and thanks to everyone. And, and those of you who are fellows, please remember to vote. Um, and this at, at the link there, www.linnean.org slash vote. And that, 
that link will be open until six o'clock tomorrow. So please do vote. And thank you very much for coming to this evening lecture and hope to see you at another one soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.